When the NES first came out, I imagine most folks thought of it as some kind of fancy electronic toy. But it's so much more than that. It's a general purpose computer. In this episode, I'm gonna show this by using a Nintendo to compute the digits of pi. There are a lot of ways to calculate pi, from old school geometric constructions all the way to modern digit extraction algorithms. For this project, I chose to use something called a spigot algorithm because it wasn't too mathematically sophisticated and it works really well with the NES's architecture. The spigot algorithm uses a cool trick involving number bases to convert pi into a form that's really easy to represent in a computer. As the algorithm runs, it performs a series of computations to undo that conversion, which causes the digits of pi to be spit out one after another. As far as pi algorithms go, it's not very fast, but it does have the benefit of using absolutely zero floating point math. Floating points are probably the most common way that computers represent decimal numbers like fractions and percentages, and modern processors have entire subsystems designed to handle them. The 6502 on the NES is pretty primitive in comparison and can't deal with floats directly. So if you want to use them, you'll either have to write your program in a compiled language like C, find a decent library, or implement the specification yourself. I wanted to do the whole project in assembly and wasn't really interested in using or writing a floating point library. So for me, the PySpigot algorithm was kind of perfect. As part of the setup, the algorithm has to initialize a big array filled with twos. Each entry in the array represents a single digit of pi in a special mixed radix form. Pi is irrational, so in normal number bases like decimal, the digits don't follow a simple repeating pattern. But by doing a little bit of math and using a sequence of different bases, you can get the digits to repeat in a really simple way. That said, when it comes to the spigot algorithm, the two forms aren't exactly equivalent, and in order for the algorithm to work, you need to have over three digits of this special form for every one decimal digit that you want to compute. Since my original idea was to fill an entire screen with the digits and a name table on the NES can fit 32 by 30 sprites, the program would have to compute a total of 960 digits. This meant that the array would have 3,200 entries with each entry requiring two bytes to support the math for the digit conversion process. So in the end, I'd need a place to store 6,400 contiguous bytes, which is kind of a problem because the system member in the NES doesn't have that many bytes. So back in the day, as NES games became more complex, their memory needs would often exceed the two kilobytes provided by the system. To get around this limitation, developers could add their own RAM chips to the game cards and control access to that memory using special logic chips called memory mappers. One of the most common mapper chips used for games like The Legend of Zelda and Final Fantasy is the Nintendo MMC1, which allows cards to support an additional eight kilobytes of RAM. 6,400 bytes is exactly six kilobytes of memory, so by using the MMC1, I could store the entire array on the cart and I I would have a ton of room to hold the rest of the program variables in the system RAM. All I had to do was change a single byte in the program's INES header to indicate to emulators that my game used Mapper 001. This mapper corresponds to a family of cartridge PCBs that are collectively known as SX ROM boards. With the setup complete, I was nearly ready to begin coding the core of the algorithm. But before I could proceed, I needed a few math routines. The 6502 on the NES only supports two math operations, 8-bit addition and 8-bit subtraction. So if you want to do something like multiplication or division, you have to use a library or write those routines yourself. Thankfully, math routines like this are pretty straightforward, and I only needed four of them, a 16-bit multiplication routine and three division routines for handling 8, 16, and 24-bit numbers. The basic the basic concept behind each routine is to use the same algorithm that most folks learn in grade school to do the math by hand, except that it has to be done in binary and you need to come up with a set of instructions that tells the computer how to do it. At first, this might seem really daunting, but doing arithmetic in binary is way easier than doing it in decimal. For example, take the problem of calculating 24 times 13. Following the by hand algorithm, you multiply the first two digits, carry the tens place, multiply the next set of digits, and add the carry. Then shift one position to the left, multiply the third and fourth set of digits, and add up all the intermediate results. Because decimal has 10 digits, in order for the process to be efficient, you kind of have to know your times tables. That's why most of us were told to learn them when we were kids. Binary, on the other hand, only has two digits, so the whole process is way less complex. The key insight is that you're only ever multiplying by a zero or a one. So if the current digit for the bottom number is a one, then write down the top number and shift one spot to the left. If it's a zero, 
then the number you write down below will just be a bunch of zeros. So you can skip this entirely by shifting left and moving to the next digit. Just like with the base 10 version, at the end, you add up all the intermediate values, which is way easier because it's just a bunch of zeros and ones. The assembly code differs a bit from the process you'd use by hand because you end up doing the additions and shifts as you go along to avoid storing those intermediate values. But besides that, it's pretty much the same thing. I coded the three division routines in a similar way, basically adapting the by hand algorithm to work for 8-bit numbers on the 6502. With that version working, it was just a matter of a little copy pasta, along with a couple modifications, and I had routines for both 16 and 24-bit numbers. With the mapper setup and the math routines in place, things were in good shape, so it was time to move on to the actual spigot algorithm. The array that the algorithm sets up in the beginning can be thought of as a big number containing many digits of pi, but converted into a special form that uses a sequence of bases. The first entry is the whole part of the number, and the rest of the entries represent the fractional part, with each one being a digit that's encoded using a particular base. In the algorithm's main loop, the first step is to multiply each of the entries in the array by 10. For a decimal number, this would be equivalent to shifting all the digits one place to the left after handling all the carries. This shift and carry process is the core idea behind the algorithm. First, the digits are multiplied by 10, then the carries are performed from right to left, and finally, the whole part of the number is divided by 10 to produce a digit of pi. Since the final step uses integer division, the operation produces a result in a remainder. The result, usually called a quotient, is the digit of pi in decimal, and the remainder is fed back into the array so it can be used to calculate the next digit. The algorithm repeats the process a fixed number of times based on the size of the initial array and produces another digit of pi with each pass. For the most part, it's pretty straightforward but the carries require a few extra math operations because of the way that the number's encoded. To perform the carries, the algorithm first divides the rightmost digit by the denominator of its corresponding base. The digit's value is set to the remainder for that division, and the quotient is then multiplied by the numerator before being carried one place to the left. The carried value is then added to the preceding digit, and the process is repeated until the algorithm reaches the beginning of the array. The same process is technically happening when you perform this kind of carry on a decimal number, but in that case, the bases for each of the digits are all the same, so it's a lot easier to do in your head. Another way to think about it is that the algorithm is a series of steps to convert the encoded number back into decimal. You could just multiply the digits by their corresponding bases and add everything together to approximate pi itself, but this would require floating point numbers with some serious precision and issue the spigot algorithm side steps by performing the calculation one digit at a time. Since I wrote the whole thing in assembly, the code ended up being pretty long, but I think I kept thinking things readable by using explicit scopes and good labels. The ROM contains a lot more than just the digit calculation code because I ended up making a nice title screen, letting the player select the number of digits to compute, and adding a slide down menu that shows a progress bar for the current iteration of the spigot algorithm. I used the NMI or non-masking interrupt to handle the graphics updates. The NES can be configured to execute a custom handler at the end of each frame, which allows you to safely update the video memory before the PPU begins drawing again. One of the side effects of using this technique is that the main thread for the program is interrupted every time the NMI fires. This can mess up the results of the spigot algorithm, especially if it's in the middle of a math routine. To get around this, I decided to give the algorithm its own dedicated chunk of RAM to hold all its variables and ensure that all the registers were saved and then restored when the NMI handler was called. If you want to learn more about using interrupts like this to do graphics programming on the NES, let me know in the comments and I'll bump that topic up in the list. All said and done, the project, which is open source and available on GitHub, came out to about 2,500 lines of assembly spread across 10 or so files. I used a slew of additional techniques to achieve the final result, including animation programming, binary coded decimal, and state machines. Handling all of those topics in this video wasn't really feasible, but I am planning on doing individual episodes about them in the future. A lot of the details for the spigot algorithm and its mathematical underpinning pinnings were also kind of out of scope, but if you're interested, I'm going to do a mini-series about them and release it exclusively on Patreon. If you want to support the channel and get access to the series, along with a bunch of other cool extras, then consider becoming a patron by signing up at patreon.com forward slash nesshacker. I also noticed a lot of you were really interested in where I get my t-shirt, so if you want to get the t-shirt that I wore in this episode, I left an Amazon link in the description. Thanks for watching Ness Hacker. If you enjoyed this episode, please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Click the bell icon if you want to be notified when I post new videos on the channel. And if you have any questions or feedback, let me know in the comments.